It's a uh, great pleasure to appear before the City Club. Join us, ask questions, and talk to the people who make New York what it is. A New York City tradition. Before we start tonight's debate on the West Side Stadium, I thought I would um, take a little poll here. Because I, maybe I've had my head in the sand, but I haven't seen a lot of fair and balanced uh, cost-benefit analysis done on um, the West Side Stadium. I, maybe I missed it. I, there's commercials on one side, commercials on the other side, all paid for by vested interest. But a really objective analysis I have not um, seen. I'm sure I just because I haven't read enough, and you people have probably all produced objective analysis. But um, I just wanted to ask, uh, I'm curious uh, if people feel the way I do. How many feel that they've had enough facts uh, to make an intelligent opinion about the West Side Stadium? Well, about uh, 10 people, I think. Uh, how many um, feel they don't have enough facts to make an objective opinion? Jeez. Um, that's about 184 people. That's, adding those two together should be everyone who's here, but somebody didn't vote. So let me ask again, uh, or maybe there's a third group. How many feel they don't have enough facts, but they have a strong opinion anyway? <laughs> Are you all Jet fans or what? Well, I'm amazed that there's that many honest people here. Um, so a lot of people have uh, opinions about this, but no facts. So that's interesting. Well, maybe tonight we can, um, we can hear some objective analysis of what the real all-in cost of the stadium is going to be and what the real all-in benefits are going to be. And, you know, hopefully we'll get some facts tonight that are not just um, totally partisan, but have some um, substance to them. And uh, the other thing I'd like to um, um, thank the City Club for uh, putting together the speakers. They're responsible. The speakers are no good. It's not the foundation's fault. It's the City Club fault. And uh, particularly if the moderator's no good, it's the City Club fault because he's from the City Club. But that's it. That's another story. But anyway, the City Club uh, has very important um, uh, speeches and uh, it's te often televised on CUNY TV and so you know we're really happy that they took the effort to put this together and uh, hopefully we can do other projects uh, in the future um, because it really worked out nicely. So without further ado, the moderator for tonight is the president of the City Club. Um, his name is Craig Whitaker, he's on my left here. He's an author of uh, Architecture and the American Dream uh, he did a plan for the Governor's Island, sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation, which I guess didn't happen, did it? Not yet. He did a plan for the original West Way. Uh, he did the original West Way plan, right? That hasn't happened, right? Not yet. You're, you're setting me up. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Okay. You didn't plan the stadium, did you? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. Um, anyway, he's a practicing architect. He should have planned the stadium. And he has a bachelor and master's degree in architecture from that well-known Eastern school called Yale. Uh, he's a professor, ad adjunct professor at NYU. So uh, he's going to be our moderator. He's going to um, uh, keep the debate under control. Let's welcome Craig Whitaker. Thank, thank you very much, Donald. Let me... Uh, publicly say thank you to the Paul and Donald Smith Family Foundation for this joint sponsorship. It's something that the City Club looks forward to. I am Craig Whitaker. I'm the president of the City Club of New York, and I'm here to take the hit if uh, tonight's debate does not go well, something about which I have a uh, few doubts. Let me uh, give you very briefly the uh, rules of the road here. We are going to take each of our four speakers, who am I, whom I'm going to introduce to you in just a moment, and give them each uh, eight minutes to uh, say everything they want to say about uh, the west side of Manhattan. 
Then we're going to follow that with about 20 minutes of discussion among the panelists. My job will simply be to prod. At some point, at, at about that point, we're going to take a very short break, and then we're going to have a, a Q&A, as long as you'd like, uh, from the audience. Uh, tonight, to my immediate left, is uh, John Altschuler, who is uh, the head of the firm we all call HR&A, Harrison Hamilton, Rabinowitz, and Altschuler. And uh, they are a very special firm because what they do mostly is help in what's called transactional business. They help government work with private developers and industry. They help industry work with um, the public. And as such, I think they have a, a very unique role in uh, municipal and, um, and uh, government affairs. Uh, John, at one point uh, in his uh, long and storied career, was the city manager of Santa Monica, California. I've already asked him why he would have wanted to leave that job for any other job. Uh, and he's told me he got tired of swimming at Christmas. Um, immediately to his left, I believe, is Tom Wright, who's the executive vice president of the Regional Plan Association. He's an adjunct assistant professor at the Columbia Graduate School of Architecture and also an adjunct professor at uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology. He was the uh, deputy director of the New Jersey State Planning Office uh, until very recently. So he too has had long experience with government and with the making of plans in the uh, public arena. To his left is David Weprin, who is from the New York City Council. Uh, he has a long career. He's a, a lawyer, having graduated from uh, Hofstra. Uh, he is active on the City Council, particularly on this issue, and has a list of uh, credentials that are um, several paragraphs long. So in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, coax him out on giving them to you. Finally, to his left is Richard Ravitch, um, whom I've known for more years than probably either Dick or I care to remember. Uh, Dick has a distinguished career uh, in government and in private affairs. When I first met him under the auspices of a, of a great civil servant, a man named Sam Rutensky, uh, Dick was uh, the R in HRH, uh, construction. Um, he went from there to be, uh, among other things, the chairman and chief executive officer of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority and in that capacity was responsible for a massive infusion of capital funds. It was, I think, uh, largely to his credit that the um, railroad was, uh, or the MTA was revitalized. He has uh, served helping Governor Kerry bail out the Urban Development Corporation. He uh, refinanced, helped recapitalize the Bowery Savings Bank. He's had a long career in affordable housing. So I think with this, uh, a galaxy of luminaries, uh, we can be assured of a, of a lively discussion. My job is a very simple one at the front end. I'm supposed to uh, tug on their sleeve when they get to six minutes and then pull them back to the chair when they get to eight. So with that, we'll begin. And we're going to begin working from um, your left to right uh, with John Altschuler first. <clears throat> Thank you, Craig. Uh, whatever uh, your panelists may disagree about, and I presume we will get to much of that in a minute, I think we all share a very fundamental belief that government has uh, a core mission in addition to keeping us safe in our homes, in addition to educating our children. Uh, one of the fundamental missions that we entrust our mayor and our governor to is to help grow our local economy. Uh, they have to do that in order to secure jobs for our citizens. They have to do that because it's from those jobs and from the buildings in which those jobs uh, are conducted that we generate the tax revenue that we need that pays for our schools, that runs our trains, uh, that cares for our ill, that cares for our elderly. Uh, I think we're here tonight because we want to decide whether or not this investment in this stadium will help fulfill that mission. Uh, based on my understanding of the stadium, based on very careful research that we've conducted of the experience of facilities like this around the United States, and we've looked at over 23 cities, looked very carefully at three, uh, our research leads us to conclude unequivocally that this stadium, uh, while it may be there primarily for people to enjoy sports, it may be there to help bring people from all over the world, to attend meetings, conventions, Super Bowls. 
it will play an important role in securing the long-term economy of the city of New York. It will be a core asset that we'll treasure for generations, that will create jobs, that will secure tax revenue. I think that for two basic reasons. First, just on a cash-on-cash -cash basis, I'm in the business of doing real estate analysis, this is a rational investment. Uh, when you look at debt service and the capital plan, uh, we'll put out something a little over $40 million. We're at a time right now where our federal government is telling us, quite consciously as a matter of federal policy, to borrow money and invest it. Uh, that's what the Federal Reserve has been telling us for a sustained period of time. Right now, interest rates are virtually negative. They're saying, spend money. We want to put it into capital projects. We can spend on an annual basis about 40 to get back on an annual basis, and there are a range of numbers. Uh, IBO is at about 52, the Independent Budget Office. ESD is at probably at the higher end at about 70. But depending on where you are, the only question is, are we 20% over, 30% over, 40% over in the return back? So the government is doing what the government ought to do. It ought to borrow money cheaply, and ought to do it to get more money back so we can pay for that investment and sustain our economy. Now, the second thing it'll do is it'll create jobs. And it'll do it in two ways. One, we have a pathetically undersized convention facility. Uh, we have many more people who want to come. And it's a very simple equation. Uh, we're in the import business here. And one of the businesses we're in is getting people from all over the world who make their money in Des Moines or make their money in Spokane or make their money in Chicago to come and spend it in New York. And they spend it in New York, and that fuels our hotels, it fuels our restaurants, and that's how we create jobs. And it's a very good business to be in. Now, our ability to grow that business is, sustain is constrained now because we just don't have any more space. So we have a very imaginative plan to get $800 million, the largest contribution made by a sports franchise, to help us build an expansion of our convention center. And it will be very interesting space. Conventioners are going to want to come to be on the floor where the Jets play. Uh, again, it's not necessarily my religion, but there are people who love football. In fact, many Americans do. Uh, all those people in those red states out there. They want to come, and they want to be where you play football. It's exciting. And this is going to be great space. And people are going to want to come. They're going to hold their events there. They're going to spend their money on our city, and they're going to help us. The second thing it'll do, and this has been a priority uh, that many have worked on for generations, which is to transform the West Side. The West Side played a fundamentally important role in our economy. We grew as a city because of our role in shipping and international trade. Our harbor was our core asset. As this industrial glacier moved back from the west side, it's left behind it a series of underutilized spaces, semi-abandoned warehouses, parking lots, and underutilized space. We need, because our midtown core is running out of office space. Uh, we are in the business of creating platforms in which people conduct work. Well, we're running out of space. Uh, the Midtown core is constrained. And even while you can find additional space here and additional space there, the more constrained we get, the higher rents go up. The higher rents go up, the more incentivized people are to move their business to New Jersey. We've lost literally hundreds of thousands of jobs, millions of dollars of tax revenue in the last 20 years to New Jersey. And we'll continue to lose it as we continue to constrain space. Now, we looked at 23 cities, and we concluded, as many have, the obvious fact, which is most stadiums don't help their cities. Most stadiums are not economic assets. Now, most of them aren't planned to do so. When we built Shea Stadium, nobody expected it to anchor a downtown in Willits Point. Uh, when they built Giant Stadium, nobody expected Giant Stadium to anchor a midtown in the Meadowlands. So, yes, most stadiums don't anchor economic growth, and most stadiums weren't intended to. And it's pretty easy to figure out why. They're surrounded by a sea of parking. They're cut off by major highways. They have no amenities. There are no development parcels to put buildings on if you wanted to. So, yeah, the majority of stadiums don't contribute to economic growth. It's not relevant to this discussion. 
The question is, let's look at those stadiums in cities like New York that were intended to create economic growth, and let's see what they've done. So we looked at a few. We looked at San Diego, we looked at Cleveland, we looked at Pittsburgh. The results are very instructive for us. In San Diego, in the one year since it's been open, we've seen a billion and a half dollars of public and private investment. They'll be at three billion by, 19, by, by 2007. They'll be at five billion by the end of this decade. We've seen close to 4,000 new residential units. We've seen new tax revenue. The experience in Pittsburgh is the same because they're building a stadium very much like the one we're gonna build. It's connected to the urban core by transit. It's amenitized by parks and open space. It's not a silver bullet approach to development. It's part of a comprehensive plan with multiple destinations. They're development parcels that are amenitized. Uh, when the new office building opens in San Diego, the highest rent they're going to get per square foot in their commercial office core will be in the office building that overlooks the stadium. These are fabulous amenities, and real estate is about location. You get few chances in a generation to create a location. We have that chance. We'll add value and we'll add jobs. Now, this has been a debate, and there are a lot of myths, and let me just run through quickly five of them. First, that stadiums are bad for economic development. It's not true when they intend to help economic development and they're executed intelligently. It's like saying the Paramus Mall didn't stimulate a lot of urban development in suburban New Jersey. Well, that has no relationship to related. Um, let me just say a couple more things and I promise to be okay. off in one minute. Okay. Um, and then you can pull my coat. I feel like Jim Lehrer. It's all right, it's all right. Um, people say the stadium financing plan is too risky or imprudent. It's not, we've seen the numbers, this is debt, it can get paid back. We can say that the stadium takes money from police, fire, and schools. The opposite is true. This will generate new tax revenue that helps pay for our police, pays for our schools. We've said the stadium is unnecessary. This is dangerous passivity in the face of competition. New York, in order to continue to grow our economy, has to invest in our future. The mayor and the governor have an oblig obligation to invest wisely. We've seen that this stadium is a wise investment in our future. New Yorkers should support it. Thanks, Craig. Uh, and first, I'll, I'll say thanks to the City Club and everyone for organizing this and uh, finding myself with this very distinguished panel is quite a thrill today. I am, uh, as was said in the introduction, Tom Wright with Regional Plan Association. So I'm going to talk about this issue a little bit more from a land use and planning perspective. I think especially with Dick Ravitch on a panel, I should leave the finance to the real experts. Um, Understand, RPA, we are a private, nonprofit civic organization, and we exist, we've been around since the 1920s, to really look at the large public policy issues facing the region, the tri-state metropolitan region. And we have been involved from moving the GW Bridge from a planned uh, entrance at 57th Street, which would have brought much traffic into Midtown, to uh, preserving open space and parks uh, across the landscapes across the region for over seven decades now. Um, we, were, we were also very involved, even, in fact, you could go back to the 1929 first regional plan that RPA produced and look at chapters that talk about the redevelopment opportunity on the far west side. RPA has been uh, for many decades looking at this area and thinking about what the future should bring uh, for it. And, and in many ways, we've been very pleased by the planning that's gone on. The city has put together a very ambitious plan and given, I think, the appropriate amount of attention uh, to this area. In fact, we have produced four different studies for the area, had a major uh, conference with about 600 people last spring, and, we, and several board meetings uh, investigating and analyzing different aspects of the plan from its assessment of overall economic growth to transportation to an urban design analysis. And at the end of the day, we became very convinced that the stadium, the location of the stadium on the far west side did not make sense for the city or the region. I think I'll, I'll put it from two different perspectives. One, from a regional perspective. We have a kind of criteria, a philosophy about where things should go in this large region of ours. 
Uh, and what that boils down to essentially is that the core of the region, uh, the central business district in Manhattan, is really meant for the highest intense uses. Those things that most need and will benefit from the transit, those things that have the proximity and connectivity to the other areas, those things that in this particular case, especially the waterfront location, which is one of the very, very uh, critical amenities for this region. Um, and those are the kinds of activities, high-end uh, commercial, high-density residential, um, civic and cultural activities that really can't go other places, that can't be located out in the meadowlands or in the outer boroughs. Those are the kinds of activities that we, we really think um, justify location in the core of the region. The two pieces, again, with this piece that really connect to that would be, again, realizing that we have so little uh, waterfront development opportunity left uh, and that maximizing the use of the waterfront and the connection to it is critical. And also the connection to the transit network, which is, uh, we have a clear crisis with the MTA, and we have a system which is being uh, so well used that we have a kind of uh, a looming capacity crisis out there. Within the core, there need to be three priorities. And the first is from a transit connection, expanding the capacity in this system. And whereas the 7 extension is a good project in terms of moving extra people, it doesn't get more people from Times Square over to Grand Central. It won't actually add much capacity at all to the transit system. Uh, we have a housing crisis, both in terms of affordability and availability. Uh, housing, there's an enormous amount of demand, pent-up demand for housing. And finally, we need to coordinate growth as we, as we talk about expanding uh, the commercial district in the city. Uh, we need to be coordinating what we do with Lower Manhattan, which still, still needs to get back on its feet, and very ambitious proposals for, uh, for downtown Brooklyn, for the Jersey City waterfront, for Long Island City, and other areas where we can see expansion of the commercial core. The reason I back up to kind of start with this, this overall philosophy, is that our sense is that the Jet Stadium is not going to work in the kind of mixed-use district that we and, frankly, the city's uh, rezoning plans and others really envision for this area. What, what's talked about is an intense, dense, mixed-use, 24-7 community and a 300-foot-high wall, a building that is either very intensely used on certain days and then completely empty and vacant on other days. Uh, a place where the traffic and, and the traffic analysis is a real concern for us in the EISs. There have been some wild overestimations, I think, in the percentage of people who would use mass transit to come to this facility. Um, those kinds of concerns really lead us to believe that a stadium is not the best use for this site. And whereas I think John can argue that the stadium might be successful in of itself, I think that we need to have a higher standard uh, when we look at this at, at, uh, at the, the rail yards in Manhattan and we look at this kind of large space uh, and, and, and land available for development in Manhattan and we think what is the best use of this site? Not what is the best location for a stadium, but what is for this site the best use of it? And if you step back and you take a look at it from that perspective, we're convinced that it were the city to, uh, to make it be known that they were going to issue, that they were going to provide a foundation and issue a request for proposals to developers. When you think about the FAR, an FAR of nine or 10 uh, on this large site can yield something like uh, over 10 million square feet of development. You could be talking about two million square foot plus commercial towers plus about 6,000 residential units. Uh, and in particular, the residential units that would probably be, be snapped up quite quickly. We've, we've heard from a lot of people in the development community that there's an enormous amount of demand, pent up demand for that. And so when you consider the aspects of this project, you've got to look at what the opportunity cost is. If not the stadium, what else can you do there? And there's been this kind of straw man put out there. That is, that if you're not in favor of a stadium, you're in favor of a hole in the ground. Well, I don't think that that's a very valid argument. And in particular, uh, that, that if the city were to, to, uh, to consider other options, we could get better development and better mixed-use development that would tie in with the other kinds of, of priorities that have been uh, uh, talked about. The expansion of the Javits Center, the rezoning of the area, uh, the improvements in civic amenities and open space, the expansion of transit to the area, all of those things can proceed 
frankly, without a stadium there. And so the question for the stadium has to become, is this the best use of this site? And we think on that, on that from a land use planning perspective, we have found this whole, um, uh, this whole proposal wanting. And that's why RPA has decided to come out uh, against the stadium. Yep. I think it's important for you to understand certain basic facts. First of all, let me say that the only reason I've spoken out on this subject is because I, I really believe very strongly that making sure that our infrastructure priorities are set right in this, in this uh, city and in this region is probably the highest priority. We have infrastructure needs that have been announced by uh, uh, elected officials, the Second Avenue subway, another tunnel from downtown out to JFK, east side access. Uh, thoughtful people have said the highest priority ought to be another Trans-Hudson crossing that'll bring more people in into Midtown uh, Manhattan. And nobody has told the public how, and that's any of those things are gonna be financed or paid for. There's no money in any budget for any of those things. And along comes a plan, whatever its merits may be, to have uh, a number seven line extension uh, built. Um, it was never on the list uh, of the MTAs as a priority item. Uh, it doesn't connect, as, as was said before, Penn Station with Grand Central. And uh, in fact, one of the ironies of all of this, the president of the Jets has been quoted as saying, if there was no number, number seven line extension, that wouldn't deter the Jets one bit from building uh, their stadium where they're building it. They're not depending on their crowds eight Sundays a year to come uh, uh, by mass transit. Um, but let me get to, to what I think is the heart of this, which is, the public decision-making process and how limited public funds are allocated, how they are decided or how the political process works to decide how they're utilized. So let's just address in these few minutes some very fundamental questions. The, the, uh, the financing of this proposal has been sort of a gray mush in the press. And I suspect there is no one who can explain in detail how the city proposes to come up with the money. Either the $600 million that they have recently proffered uh, to contribute towards the construction of the Jet Stadium, let alone uh, the um, billions of dollars that they propose to borrow to build the number seven line extension or all the public infrastructure associated with the Hudson Yards development. Let me say that they, they say that they, those borrowings will be paid back out of the revenues to be realized uh, in the long term from all of those improvements. Today, New York has 50 million square feet of empty office space. And the highest priority, according to the governor, is to build at least 10 million square feet more office space down in lower Manhattan to ensure that the Port Authority would, at, at the very least, continue to receive the ground rent from the site uh, of the uh, Twin Towers so that the Port Authority can continue to finance the necessary infrastructure uh, in New York. The mayor has announced that, the, that $13 billion are necessary, he told the city council this, uh, to, to restore our schools to a state of good condition. Where is that money coming from? Um, I could go on with the list of things that are underfunded, but let me go back to where the city has proposed to get its money. They say they will sell bonds of the Hudson Yard Infrastructure Corporation. Nobody will buy the bonds uh, that aren't backed by real revenues just out of aspiration. It's a form of faith-based financing. Everybody knows this. And, and therefore, what, what the deputy mayor has said is that he is going to make it possible to borrow this money by providing some form of financial support from the Transitional Finance Authority. The Transitional Finance Authority was created by the legislature about five years ago to help the city borrow more money by using its income tax to support borrowings when the city was chock-a-block full of up to its debt limit which uh, is measured by the assessed value of all real estate in New York City. 
And the legislature made it very clear, and I, uh, anybody can find this material, I certainly did, there is nothing in the law whatsoever that gives the Transitional Finance Authority the power to credit enhance uh, the bonds of the Hudson Yard Infrastructure Corporation to buy or invest in the commercial paper. That will be challenged in a court and successfully so. The legislature has made it abundantly clear in the memorandum that supported the bill that was enacted that that was not to be used other than for projects that went through the capital budget process of the city of New York, which gets me to my last point. This process here is all below the radar screen. You have not read anywhere where the city is going to come up with 300 million, let alone 600 million, to contribute to the Jet Stadium, uh, to the cost of the Jet Stadium. And they have not, and have made it very clear, they do not intend to go to the legislative body of the city of New York that has the power over the budget to seek their approval as a budget item. If they went to the city council and the mayor wanted to spend $600 on building the stadium, it would be debated in the city council, and if it were approved, some of us might disagree, but we couldn't question the integrity or viability of the process. That's what the Charter of the City of New York says, and that's what the Transitional Finance Authority Enabling Statute says. And this is an effort to totally circumvent the elected legislative body of the City of New York. <laughs> Last of all, let me say that um, I was a developer, that was my business, and I believe in bold ideas, and I admire uh, the mayor and the deputy mayor very much uh, for their integrity and their intelligence, and I have rarely disagreed with them. Um, but I do on this subject, because this is an effort to do something that makes no short-term economic sense and takes resources away from compelling current needs. Having had the, the honor and the privilege and the fu ultimately the satisfaction of rebuilding the subway system, I also had the experience of inheriting it in 1979 when uh, governors and mayors had been much more focused on building new things, uh, new projects, big buildings, uh, new subway lines. And for those of you, and most of you in this room are too young to remember this, but uh, for those of us who aren't, we remember the miserable condition of the New York City subway system in 1979. It was the biggest detraction to economic development, uh, disincentive, I mean, uh, for economic development and for commercial expansion in New York. Uh, and it was because the, the limited resources that were available to the MTA were being directed by the governor and the mayor to be used for new projects and not to fix the system. And if the MTA's request and stated and explained need for $19 billion of capital funds to maintain, forget new starts, they also have a request to start work on the Second Avenue subway, to start work on East Side Access and, and other uh, new projects. But if their core program of $19 billion isn't funded, the subway system and the commuter rail system will start down the slippery slope again. And I would respectfully submit to you that that is far worse than not making an investment uh, in something that may uh, hopefully, uh, possibly uh, provide a return many years down, down the pike. You know, if we live in a world of unlimited resources, uh, which is what perhaps some of our elected officials think we do, uh, and they certainly did some years ago, uh, then the decision matrix is a different one. But when you are facing the kinds of budget deficits that I have, uh, at, at the risk of oversimplifying them, told you about tonight, and suggested some of the fundamental capital needs, uh, I hope that the citizens of New York uh, have an opportunity to express their view about what their priorities ought to be, uh, whether maintaining the subway system and the schools uh, and the streets and the roads and the bridges, where does that fit in in comparison uh, to this kind of multi-billion dollar investment 
uh, for the future. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I'd like to uh, put a question out on the table and uh, start by saying that when architects think of a megastructure, they usually think of a very complex building, different scales, different uses. Under that rubric, Grand Central Station would qualify as a megastructure. I think of a megastructure in urban affairs as trying to get two guys to get their money up at the same time. And under that definition, Grand Central Station, Grand Central Terminal was not that at all. Neither was Rockefeller Center, neither was the World Trade Center. I was asked the other day by a reporter what I thought about the West Side, and I said, I don't really have a dog in that fight. But I do think that the job of trying to put this thing together is a bit like herding cats. That is, there are so many areas and sources of funds that are going to be needed to make this successful, so many different actions by levels of government. I wonder if uh, one of you four would like to try and take that on. Is this mic working? I think so. No? Yes. OK. Thank you. Um, the, the problem with that is um, we're missing a major factor here, which is um, that we're basically leveraging off of the largest private investment in any stadium deal in the history of stadium financing. And that, and that is $800 million that is going to be put up front uh, by the New York Jets. Uh, any, the, the closest, I think, was um, Soldiers Field in Chicago, which was uh, about $200 million, uh, in, which is also in a, in, a, in a downtown area. Yes, there are a lot of components, but uh, the thing that really makes it work, in, in my opinion, is leveraging off of the $800 million. Uh, the city contribution uh, is going to be $300 million, and the state contribution of $300 million. The state and city uh, will will get together, and... Um, and we'll know soon enough, but, but basically the pieces are coming together. The details of the financing plan are, are not as significant, in my opinion, as the fact that you have a, a major backer in the city, a major backer in the state, and a major backer uh, in the Jets. And um, as uh, John had pointed out before, uh, I have a Wall Street background. I was in public finance for 15 years uh, with various major firms. We're talking about a historically low interest rate environment uh, in the history of public finance uh, in, in, the, in the world, uh, where these rates, interest rates are the lowest uh, they've been in decades. And uh, now is, is the right time to borrow long term for our future. And we're also leveraging off of that $800 million private investment. Could I uh, respond? Go, go ahead, Dick. Uh, David knows equally well that not only are interest rates low at this point, but that the rate at which you borrow money is also a function of the credit that lies behind it. And nobody has suggested at any point that the city or state's credit be involved in this. But what they have suggested is that the, all the city's income tax revenues be hypothecated to support this financing. And that's five and a half billion dollars a year of revenue. And if they got their way and all of it was necessary to pay back this debt, then that means the city council would be deprived of the ability to appropriate five and a half billion dollars, uh, which otherwise would go into the general fund of the city of New York. And I, I don't think anybody can argue with that as a fact. Um, perhaps somebody could disagree with the legal interpretation of the authority of the mayor to do this without the city council's consent. Um, second of all, uh, we keep hearing that the Jets are going to put up $1,800 million, but every time we read anything scanty as it may be about the details of the financing, we hear that the Jets maybe have the opportunity to be the beneficiary of the issuance of $800 million of tax-exempt debt by some municipal uh, instrumentality on which they might pay the debt, debt service. Big difference whether you pay interest on $800 million in municipal debt or whether you write a check for $800 million. So third of all, we're told that the Jets are going to take the overrun risk on the cost of building the stadium. Well, when they say that, whose credit is going to be behind the promise to take that risk? If it's just the entity of the Jets that enters into the lease, then 
Uh, that's a very different thing from having the parent corporation or the owner guarantee the completion. And last of all, and perhaps most importantly of all, uh, I, when I was chairman of the MTA, we built the Long Island layup yard, which is what this is going to be built above. And I'm very familiar with the construction uh, process there. And I'm very familiar with what the, or I have a strong view, I should put it, view of what those air rights would be worth uh, that the MTA owns to a residential developer. And uh, in my judgment, that property is worth clearly seven or eight hundred million dollars. And if the MTA conveys that property for anything less than that, uh, I, I think it would be an outrage. Uh, it would be irresponsible action uh, um, with respect to their primary obligation to make sure the transit system works properly. And it would be another subsidy uh, for the hidden subsidy uh, for the Jets. Let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me get a rejoinder from, uh, from John on this. Let's take each of these issues in turn because there are a number that are important. First, uh, we ought to encourage the Jets to use taxes and financing. Uh, they're going to guarantee it. There's no risk to the taxpayer uh, in the proposed financing at all. Uh, what we get by the taxes and financing is one very simple thing. We get the United States Treasury to support us. Uh, by using a tax exempt financing, we get to use the exemption on federal bonds, uh, the federal tax exemption on our bonds. So what are we doing with the tax exempt financing? We're not getting the city to subsidize it. We're not getting the state to subsidize it. We're getting the jets to guarantee the use of a subsidy that comes from the federal taxpayer to New York City. We all ought to be in favor of that. So the second thing we ought to be clear about is that if we wiped away the capacity of local government to use its general revenues to credit and enhance what are really tax increment bonds here, we would shut down the local development in America. If you look at how the city of Chicago, if you look at how the city of San Francisco, if you look at how the city of Los Angeles, if you look at how Washington, D.C. finances their future in economic development, it's by exactly these means. So if we applied the test suggested uh, by members of this panel, that you would never use municipal credit to stand behind uh, a future revenue stream, we'd be taking local government out of the business of economic growth in our country. Uh, what we're doing here is getting New York to begin to play the game like our competitors so we can get the jobs that we need here. There's no there's nothing, frankly, very innovative here. There's nothing very tricky here. There's nothing very risky here. What we're doing is getting the city and state of New York to catch up with the practice as local economic development has been practiced successfully by virtually every large jurisdiction in the United States. Now, we've heard that these yards uh, could produce substantial revenue to the MTA. I've seen no offer from a developer. We've seen nothing from a proposer. Uh, we have to come up with $400 million for the platform. We have to handle uh, a, an indemnification for cost overrun. We have to handle environmental mitigation. Uh, if, in fact, there are people out there uh, that want to make their offer, let's hear it. I think that uh, Craig said it very well uh, when he began. He said getting uh, a ver two major jurisdictions, the city and state of New York, to agree. We've spent 10 years, actually closer to 15 now, arguing about the expansion of the Javits Center. We now have an alignment between the city and the state and how to do it. Part of that is a commitment of $800 million of private investment towards an expansion of convention space, delivering it at a cost roughly equal to the northernmost expansion of the center. Uh, so we've got not two parties, we've got three. We've got our city government, we've got our state government, we have a private investor who will stand behind an $800 million obligation. Uh, the time, I think, is past for people to say, gee, I think I have another better idea, or maybe somebody will show up next week and write us a check, or gee, wouldn't it be nice if we had? We've got a plan, we don't execute it now, we'll lose for another generation a chance, and we'll be sitting around here in 2015 and 2020 saying, what's going on with the West Side? 
Why are the jobs going to New Jersey? Why don't we have the amenities on the west side? Why is our midtown core continue to constrain? We have a chance, we have an obligation as a city and a state to take it now. John, can I ask you a question? You said we have the city and the state ready to do this. I mean, we do have constitutions, we do have legislative bodies. Why are the governor and the mayor trying to do this in a way to avoid any approval by the legislative body in Albany or the, or the city council? All the city council has to do is approve the zoning, and they don't even have to approve it west of 11th Avenue because ESDC is in there to, circum to circumvent any zoning power that the city has, because they have the zoning override power. Why has the legislature said they're ready to contribute one dollar or three hundred million from Albany? Yet they have not, and nor has the city council ever been asked whether they're prepared to appropriate three hundred million dollars. Well, well, the problem with that, if I may, on behalf of the city council and, and, and the state, first of all, we, as far as having no public debate on this issue. Uh, we've had um, three hearings at the City Council, uh, three full, di full days, where actually um, the uh, hall of the City Council, if you've ever been in the chamber, uh, looked like a, a very bad wedding. We had um, the opponents on one side of the council with an aisle in the middle and the supporters on the other side uh, with booing and hissing uh, at, at every stage. Uh, this has been aired uh, for months and months. Uh, there's been hearings by the um, State Assembly, by Richard Brodsky's committee. Uh, there's been, there's been, uh, there, will, there will have to be uh, a Public Authorities Control Board approval, so the state will have to sign off on the deal before it's final, uh, as well as the City Council will be voting in January. Uh, on the land use change, yes, but everybody knows, there's no secret here, based on uh, millions and millions of dollars of spent uh, by the opponents and the, and the supporters on TV advertising. There's no secret that if we approve the land use, that'll pave the way for the stadium. I mean, it's not like uh, nobody in the city council knows that the stadium is a major part of the land use change. I mean, we're, we're well, kidding ourselves if that's the case. But so there will be significant public debate at the city council, and um, I'm optimistic that it'll pass, but there will be, the city council will uh, vote on the land use change, yes, which will, everybody knows, involve a uh, future stadium. I, I, I'll say, though, I think that, that it, that's precisely the kind of trap that organizations or individuals trying to look at this have found themselves falling into. You can't be for the Javits expansion without also supporting the stadium. You can't be for the rezoning without also supporting the stadium. Because these things have been linked, not, I don't think, because they absolutely have to be, but because by doing that, uh, the backers of the stadium have managed to, frankly, marginalize the groups that have other interests, things, groups that would like to see uh, the convention center move ahead or the rezoning move ahead or others don't have the opportunity to just support those one thing, th that, that specific issue, because these things have been connected to each other. I, I'll also just say, I don't think, John, it's fair to say that because no other developer is here ready, willing, and able to put the money on the table that this is the only option we have. It's been clear for quite a quite a long time that this was the project that the city was pushing. This is the one that was going to get moved forward. I think to some degree that could be the, the, the test. If the city were to really do an honest uh, RFP process and to really entertain uh, uh, alternative proposals for the site, then I think the public, and if there were to be a robust public process, then I think you could really see the alternatives that could go on that site uh, other than a stadium and have a fair analysis of these, of these options. John. Let, let's be... <laughs> Folks, let's, let's hold the applause and let the speakers do their speaking. We have seen very few New Yorkers uh, with the bureaucratic and political acumen of Richard Ravitch. And I think uh, my panelist knows full well that if the Speaker of the City Council and his members wish to stop this project, they could. That if the Assembly and its members and the Speaker wish to stop this project, they could. If the Senate wished to stop this project and they wanted to, they could. Uh, this project will go forward, uh, and it will only go forward, because our mayor, our governor, our city council, our senate, our assembly, let it go through. And it's the only way it's going to happen. So we can argue about whether or not it should have happened by Route XYZ or, re, or Route ZYX, uh, but let's not kid ourselves. Everybody on this panel knows that if 
one of the major leaders of the legislative bodies wanted to stop it, they would and they could. So it's going to happen if it happens because the duly elected government in all of its aspects let it happen. Secondly, uh, John, that is just a, a legally incorrect statement. The city council is not being asked to appropriate the money, and you know very well, you, and you're just as polished and accomplished as I am at this game. Uh, <laughs> you know very well. That's the nicest thing well anybody said to me in a long time, Richard. I, 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 I'm glad you, I showed up tonight. I am too. Yeah. Fun, to be with, fun to be with you. But you know very well that it's a very different thing and I can't tell you how many members of the city council have said to me, I would never vote for an appropriation of this amount of money, but I certainly not going to get into a fight over the zoning. And you know very well there's a big difference. And the legislature has not yet spoken out. The mayor and the governor submitted a bill last June to the legislature, which they urgently wanted to give them the legislative authority, not even to finance this, but just to acquire property and take a whole series of other steps. And the legislature so far has refused to pass that bill. Dick, uh, well, we I'm sorry, panelists, I'm, I'm sorry, but we are nearly at the, uh, at the break point here. But what we are going to do is continue the discussion in, uh, in just a moment, and then we're going to give the audience a chance to uh, throw zingers at the stage. I think the time's up.